I suppose I ought to start this interview by singing a beloved Christmas carol because after all we're recording this in early <laughs> December 2004 but we'll forego what would be for you I'm sure certain agony mm -hmm. unless Larry can sing no. I don't know <laughs> how about you no. but we are on the Salmon River Road speaking with uh, Jill and Larry Gooley and we've wanted to talk to to Larry for a long, long time because we've had admired his work from afar. Here's a guy who is as interested as we are and perhaps even more in area history. And we have an interest in it and we try to chronicle it via this television show, but Larry actually gets down to the brass tacks mm -hmm. and he writes about it. And that's cool. How are you? Pretty good. How are mm -hmm. you, Jill? I'm fine. In case you can't see over my shoulder, there is a, I was going to say a crackling fireplace, but I haven't heard it crackling <laughs> no, yet. Crackling Just yet. a soft <laughs> fan in the background. It's one of these newfangled gas fireplaces that feels beautiful, that feels beautifully. And we're not going to tell our audience on television that you ran out of fuel last night. And <laughs> <laughs> that. But, but anyway, we're here early in the Christmas season, and it all started with an almost anonymous email that I got. And I had no idea what it was all about at first, because it said bloated toe. But i got to tell you, Larry, that that did catch my attention. Yeah, it would. So if you chose bloated toe, you, if, huh? No, it's toe. It's toe, not a toad. But that would have been good, too. There is actually a website now called Bloated Toad. We Come discovered on. it the other day. Yeah, there is. Yes. Well, you're bound to get on it. I'll tell you, they, <laughs> the people cross-reference, as we found out during their recent presidential election. That's very interesting. <laughs> anyway, we're going to talk a lot about a book called <laughs> Lion Mountain. I don't know how much time you spent trying to pick out the title for this book, but since it's about Lion Mountain... Well... The second part of the title, The Tragedy of a Mining Town, that came from a conversation with uh, an old friend of mine. We worked together years ago, and he used to tell me stories about all kinds of things, about Lion Mountain history and about how tough the people were. And eventually one day he mentioned that people just wouldn't believe the tragedy that went on up there, and that just stuck with me. And I wanted to use it in the title someday, so that's what I did. So that's what you did. Yeah, that's where it came from. I confess that I received this book only a few days ago, Larry <laughs> called me up on what would have been last Saturday night in real time saying, you got to be home Sunday morning because I want to bring the book down. Maybe you should at least look at the cover before we do the interview. <laughs> it's like I'm going to prepare for two weeks for these interviews. Mm -hmm. So I found it hanging on my door when I got from breakfast. I missed you by about 20 minutes, I guess, mm -hmm. Sunday morning. But I did leaf through it, and I'm so fascinated by what you've done. Uh, and I should preface this by saying that Calvin has covered historical things and for many, many years on television. Before that, on the radio, I made a point of interviewing people who are interested in history, spending a lot of time doing audio interviews with people who are 100 years old, because we can learn a lot from people who make it, who make it to 100. Mm -hmm. Like, how did you get there, mm -hmm. you know? And this book is based on <clears throat> interviews that you did 20 years ago or more, yeah, right? Yeah, 24 years ago. Before we go any <clears throat> farther, though, I think it's important just to find out who you are. I know you're a Northern Tier boy. You grew up and went to about 16 schools before you graduated from <laughs> high school. Yeah, they forced me out, right? <laughs> oh, I, I graduated from NCCS in Champlain. But um, you, you had to go to different schools in the process, right? No. Well, you went Saint to St. Mary's. St. Mary's. And I was there, when they closed, I had two more years to go. I had to finish up at the other school, which was Champlain so Central, but they combined. So you were in the first class? The second graduating class. Second graduating yeah, class. Wasn't it? First graduating class with Calvin's brother. That's how he knows. No, oh, I, thought, I thought my sister went there. Well, it's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> the first year you went, it was Champlain Central, then it was Northeastern. <laughs> That was the, yes, that's right. The merger the Moore's the Moore's kids also graduated with us. That Did was they? the first time we met. So anyway, you were born and brought up in Champlain. Yeah. Champlain. Then what? Did you go to college or start working or what no, happened? I started happened? working. Started working, had a family and I tried writing but I was just too busy being a father and being a writer, so that's actually how this came about. I did the Altona Flat Rock book and I was beginning my second one and I just 
didn't have enough time. There was, it was taking too much time away from the family. So I did the interviews, and then I put it on the shelf until now. It's a crazy world we live in, and every day I talk to people who don't have enough time. Mm -hmm. And I just recorded the December health tip for the Clinton County Health Department's tip line, and it's all about stress. And when the person sent me the copy to record this morning on the telephone, they said, don't let this stress you out just because it's the <laughs> second day of December and was supposed to be on yesterday. <laughs> but none of us ever have enough time. But just, uh, you did the Altona Flat Rock book. Our viewers are familiar with the Altona Flat Rock <coughs> region thanks to at least two television programs that Calvin and I have done together with professionals. And you did one or two before that, right, with uh, the late Bob then, including, and and including an interview with Larry way back about that. So it's a, that's a unique part of the North Country and a unique part of the world, actually, as we've yes. learned throughout our interviews. So you were fascinated by it and you got into it. Right. But the reason I ask you about your background, Larry, is that most people don't just start writing without getting some kind of a writing degree or creative writing degree or a little background, but you just decided you could do it. Yeah, it was a, it was a favorite of mine through grade school. Well, at St. Mary's especially, that's where it was nurtured, with the, the nuns. Yeah, and I, I just... Nuns do nurturing like yeah, that, don't they? When yeah. it was time to do a book report, it might be a 120-page book, and my report would be about 60 pages. So, <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> He's a man so, after my own heart. So I just like to write. I we just finished a Christmas story for this year, and, and my wife is my best editor. And we have some interesting discussions about my work. And uh, always, she says, too wordy. And it brings back those memories of my college professors in big red line. Too many words. Eliminate about nine mm -hmm. out of those 15 words in every sentence. Mm -hmm. How about you? Jill, where are you from? I am actually originally from Whitehall. I graduated from Whitehall High School and from uh, SUNY Plattsburgh right here, and I now work at Wyeth. What kind of a degree did you get at Plattsburgh? I have a Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry. That, that, that suits her for being your best critic, doesn't and, it? And? She didn't finish. And? Well, much to my mother's chagrin, I'm at still attending school, um, pursuing a second degree in Civil Engineering at the U University of Vermont. Wow, good for you. That was, that was, I'm not sure, I was going to say that was my first love, but I'm not, I'm not sure that it was. Always in the back of my mind, I wanted to get into communications. But uh, when I graduated from high school, those are the kinds of colleges that I uh, <coughs> applied to, because I wanted to be a civil engineer. Oh, yeah. So isn't it interesting mm -hmm. how our paths cross and get together mm -hmm. in spite of the things we do? Mm -hmm. you're, you're supposed to mention your mother's name? Oh, absolutely. Gosh, don't forget that. I didn't forget. Anna Gooley is my mother. <laughs> and she'll be very happy to see I finally acknowledge that. Hi, Queenie. <laughs> oh, I and, love it. And, you know, she did help a lot on this, actually, and on the Flat Rock book, because um, I didn't know how to type. And she did the typing. Oh, that helps when you're a writer, when you don't know how to type, well, Larry. I did prefer longhand, but uh, once I discovered computers, no, I like that much better. But she, she typed the Flat Rock book many times, and this also. All the interviews, she typed all of them for me. We're going to talk a lot more about that. We're going to get into this book, your, both of your backgrounds, and how you do give Jill a lot of credit in this book for her work and, and other people, too. And I can't wait to get into the meat and potatoes of Lion Mountain because it just happens that one of the people he interviewed was Plink Tara Savage, mm -hmm. one of my favorite people in the whole wild wide world. And when you say that they were a tough generation. Mm -hmm. You weren't just <laughs> kidding. Especially Plink. Oh, my goodness. So let's get into the Lion Mountain, the tragedy of a mining town on Hometown Cable. Calvin reminds me that I didn't mention your last name. It's Jill McKee. Yes. Okay, just to get that s squared away. And he just dropped in before the camera started again, the fact that he's interested in Lake Champlain canal boats, and of course that's a, a favorite thing of mine. I did a recent column about it a few weeks ago in the Press Republican. We've interviewed many people. Of course, our good friend, Captain Frank Pabst, mm -hmm. a pilot on Lake Champlain, worked on canal boats and knows a lot about it, and I've done 
I've done research on the origin of the Irish settlement and the Irish settlement road, which as the crow flies is not very far from where you are right here, and how the Irish uh, settlers didn't come here during the potato famine, but they came to work on the canals. And so there's a wonderful <coughs> part of the North Country history, hooked up to Whitehall, yeah. hooked up to Rouse's Point. Mm -hmm. Lake and, and I'm sitting right on Lake Champlain in between, mm -hmm. so you see? So that's something you started on, or you did some research on? I've or? been researching it, yes. Over the years, whenever I did have time to go to the uh, Feinberg, I would research it there. So I, you know, I have a good list of boats that were built in Champlain, and there's a lot more to dig up yet. That's a great resource. Mm -hmm. uh, special collections, the Feinberg Library at Plattsburgh State, we like to give them credit as often mm -hmm. as possible, because for people who love history, I can get lost in there for days or days. weeks and That's forget lunch and supper, mm -hmm. which might not be a bad idea for me. <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> the genesis, if you will, of this book is 1980... 1980 and 81 when I did the interviews. Why did you do the interviews? What inspired you to get into the story of Lion Mountain at that time? That's 23, 22 years ago. Well. It's a history that looked like it was pretty much disappearing. The mines had been closed for a long time, and friends were telling me about um, the struggles that people went through, people that died in the mines, and like I said, the tragedy. The Almost every aspect of life, there was tragedy up there. And there were foreigners, so many foreigners that came here, died, and were going to be anonymous if somebody didn't save it. It's a piece of history um, that it's very hard to get young people excited about because it's just not visible when you drive through the town anymore. Right. It was fascinating <clears throat> to me when I first moved back here in 1961. Mm -hmm. So I was able to interview a lot of those people on the radio uh, for my own purposes. But you just decided to go up there with a pad of paper. You didn't even have a tape recorder. Well, I did. Did you? Thank goodness, yes. I didn't and think you recorded it this, by the way it sounded. Well, I did, but I. Um, it was difficult just to get people, to, first of all, they were strangers. I was a stranger to them. They let me in their homes, and then to get them to open up with a recorder going, and then once in a while you have to stop it to change tapes. But um, they spoke openly, as anyone reads that. Well, there are a few curse words in there. They did speak openly. Uh, these uh, listen in in light of what we've already said, and in light what and of what your fathers and grandfathers and great grandfathers might know about <laughs> lion, mining and Lion Mountain. It's a miracle that there were not a lot of curse words, yeah. because this was tough life, and you had to use a word to describe the situation or the emotion that was involved. We've we've done some shows about mining before, but. Lion Mountain was very special in many ways. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so you went up there and over a, a period of how long? Almost two years? Um, probably a year and a half. There was you did have a tape recorder. Yes. You're, did you record every interview? Um, not every, almost every interview. I, there were, I did do some with notepads, some informal ones, and some to just go clarify some facts. I work in courtrooms almost every day as a crime victims advocate in the Department of Probation. And I watch court stenographers at work, mm -hmm. trying to type mm -hmm. as they go. So when you told me, who was it, your mother? Yeah, my mom. I'm so glad we mentioned her. Anna Gooley, yes. <laughs> She's the one that started the transcriptions. Yes. She's the one that started typing. Right. And Have you? Including curse words? Including the curse uh, words? Yeah, the curse words are there. She says a few curse words herself. Yeah. And, they're, and they're all spelled correctly. Yes, they are. And <laughs> Calvin's lassie. You might see the camera shake a little bit. It's a good thing it's on a tripod. <laughs> but anyway, that took her a long time. When did she start the typing process? Um, as I was doing the interviews, I asked Really? Her, yes. And I would, you know, I, I wrote everything out longhand and then passed it on to her to type. Because it was, I didn't have any modern recorders, so I didn't have a foot pedal where I could work back and forth, so I had to keep rewinding. It was hard to understand sometimes when they spoke. And I didn't want to interrupt them because they were cutting loose. Most people who write a book don't ever get a chance to tell the public exactly how many droplets of blood and cups of sweat and teaspoons of tears are included in those pages. <laughs> 
not only the, the torrid stories and wild memories of the people you interviewed, but just the logistics, the process of transferring all of that mm -hmm. into a, a relatively innocuous looking little book that's how many pages? Yeah, it seems uh, less than 300 pages. But it, believe me, it was considerable. <laughs> yeah, it's almost anticlimactic to see it now, but just just the uh, statistics that I had to compile and, and analyze, the deaths and things like that. Because when you're, it's one thing to tell stories, and I'm a, I love to tell stories. And in my column, people expect it to be relatively light. Mm -hmm. When you're putting it in a book, you have to try to get it right. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And that's kind of hard because our memories are, are I won't say tainted, but let me say that our, our memories are affected by who we are mm -hmm. and, and our perception. You know, the three of us, and you know the old story, can watch an event and have a totally, entirely different slant on mm -hmm. what it is. So you're getting anecdotal information, tons of it from right. these. How many people? Eleven interviews. Ten are featured in there. One of them was just for some baseball information, really. So, well, if you can't talk so, about Lion Mountain unless you mm, talk about baseball, that's what it is—mining and baseball. I mean, my goodness, I, I correspond with a with a gentleman by the name of Jack Glasgow who grew up in Danamora, and his basketball teams and baseball teams played against Lion Mountain. So, of course, we correspond every day, and I tell him I'm coming here to talk to Larry Gooley, and you know, never mind mining. He's talking about the miners, but he's talking about the miners in an entirely different way as it applies to athletics and baseball and mm -hmm. and basketball and and just wonderful history. And thank goodness for guys like Calvin and Bob who've done history, the history of the baseball. Imagine what this book would have been like had you gone up 10 years before you did in the 1960s or mm -hmm. 1970s when a lot more of these guys were alive. Yeah. The tragedy of it is, of all the people you interviewed for this book, how many would our viewers guess are alive today in mm -hmm. 2004, uh, that many years later? No, just one. Just one. And that, my friends, is the reason why a book like this is so absolutely important. We're going to open the book. We're going to show pictures. Where did you get all the pictures? Well, two people mainly. Rita Quetchen was extremely helpful. Uh, she hadn't met us before, and she just brought us into her home, brought out huge stacks of pictures, and let, let oh, us select. Don't you love it? And Were you there? Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Jerry Blanche, same thing. He just he asked if he could do anything else. He was very, very helpful. He is the one surviving person that I interviewed. We beg people for pictures. We begged them on this camera. We have literally begged people to go in their dressers and find pictures that will enhance these great historical stories before it's too late, before their the people die and the pictures are thrown on the dump or put in a garage sale. But you you hit the mother load, right? Oh yeah, with those two people especially. Were you? When did you get involved in this project, Jill? Um, well, several years ago, but um, much more in depth in the last, in the recent months when we really started uh, deciding we were actually going to get the book printed and get it put out. So what, you know, he thanks you in the book, but until people get to get a <coughs> copy of it, what actually was your role? Define it for me. Um, I did help with some editing years ago, and um, more recently my main um, part in the book was scanning, resizing, retouching the photos that we obtained from Rita Quetchen and Jerry Blanche. I took a few of the photos that are in the book myself. Mm, not a few. I think 36. Really? That's more than a few. 36? Well, yes. the picture of, of Lion Mountain in the front of the book and then the uh, all the gravestones. There's actually 36 in there? I, it think, seem like yeah, that I think there are 35 gravestones that she took pictures of. But mostly it was, I spent several hours scanning pictures. That took a really long time. And thank goodness we, we finally decided to buy a scanner a few months ago. We hemmed and hawed about it for quite a while. You didn't have a and scanner? Not until recently. Luckily, if we hadn't had a scanner, we couldn't have done this at all. Um, but I spent, we wanted to get Rita's pictures to her, back to her quickly, because she was so nice to lend them to us, and they were so valuable. So I spent, I think, two days straight just scanning in pictures to get them all onto the computer and then get the originals back to her. And then I worked on, on retouching them and 
making sure that they somebody were told me yesterday, and I was talking with a former wiry <laughs> chief engineer, Bob Broadwell, who lives up the road from me. He's been retired for many years. He says that you can scan black and white pictures with his scanner in a few seconds. I've got an old flatbed scanner, and believe me, it takes more than a few seconds to scan one picture. Um, doesn't take that long for the scanning, but um, I did play with the brightness and contrast and, and like that to try to Thank get the picture. Goodness for good computers quality. and digital programs that yes. will allow you to enhance them. Between our scanner and uh, we have Paint Shop Pro, that worked really well as far as retouching the pictures, getting some of the pictures had spots, scratches, things like well, that. It wasn't just that. Too. While I'm working on my computer, I did I formatted the entire book, so I didn't I didn't just edit it. I formatted the entire thing and. That means that if I get to a certain page and I need a photo to fit, she's already done it. I have to ask her to resize it. And while she's working on her schoolwork and has a full-time job, she did this constantly. And it was a lot of pressure because we did have deadlines. Not a single argument? No, actually, that was the good part. I was amazed. Come on. I, didn't, didn't really. I was being facetious. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's plenty of those other times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We argued about plenty of other things. There's a lot of pressure when you're doing this. Because yeah, there was. For those people who don't know Larry, I don't know if calling him a perfectionist would be accurate, but he wants to get it right. Yeah. He did in the Flat Rock book, he does in everything he's done, and you, you've done other things. You, didn't you put a thing together for soccer, for Shazy Soccer? Yes, I did. What was that all about? I should mention that before we go any further. <clears throat> well, it was just another fascination of mine, and I, I love sports, but it was um, Shazy Soccer is the best anywhere. And I decided to cover every game they'd ever played. So I, when I put it together, I think it was around 88 it went up to. And it covers all the games they played, everything I could find in the newspapers. So I, I did statistics on all those years. I reproduced the articles, made it into um, scrapbooks, and it was uh, six to a set. I was supposed to continue it, but it, financially it just would not work. It's too bad because of what just happened. To a nice, real nice highlight right there. It's amazing, isn't yeah. it? It's truly amazing. But you've been involved in athletics for a long time. Were you a student athlete? I just I coached mostly. I played a lot, but I played I played intramural some. But but I've always loved sports. Played everything. How can you be from the North Country and not be connected in some <laughs> way with athletics, especially in my case raising fifteen kids? I was telling somebody the other day when they asked me if I could help them out with hockey and I said I got too much on my plate and I said, But I if it helps you to know it, I did, we did have five kids that were playing hockey at the same time. He said, what? <laughs> so anyway, yeah, we've all been involved in athletics. Mm -hmm. So this is, I, I always like to ask people, how does it feel now that it's over? It feels pretty good. Tremendous well, satisfaction, uh, relief. My answer, my answer would be it's not over. <laughs> I'm just about as busy right now as I was. With this book? Yes, because we formed our own publishing company, and I we're, noticed that we're handling every aspect. Well, the only thing we didn't do was printing and binding. You were taking a, an order, book order, when I walked in with yes. Calvin, and I walked in about an hour ago. Yes, I just I had a, a call, and we had a, an email almost at the same time. A woman whose father died in the mines, and one of my favorite parts is she wants two more copies to give to her children because she wants them to keep the memory alive of what happened. Thank goodness for that. Yeah, that and was that's sat that's satisfying to you, not just to sell oh, yeah. books, but to keep the memory alive. I think you put it very that's, well. That's what started this, right? So it's before Christmas time, and hopefully you will sell a few books. But most, a lot of people these days, when they write a book, they don't want to go through the publishing process um, in trying to find a literary agent and or a publisher is willing to risk something, including capital on the on publishing right. a book, and so they do it themselves. Right. I did start, but I didn't want to complete the process. It was too long and drawn out. It, it would probably be another year. And, and so um, you did it. Well, I, I felt that the two of us could do a pretty good job. Not a perfect job, but, you know, we didn't have all the equipment we needed, but um, I, I like the way it looks. I'm pleased, I have very to pleased tell with you, the picture that we went to. It's... Uh, Sharp Offset Printing in Rutland, Vermont. As how did you come across them? Yes, they also go by the name, which is on the spine, Academy Books. Yeah. And um, I was searching on the internet, and I got I got quotes from maybe ten different places, and I really wanted to deal just in Plattsburgh, but um, 
you know, price was one influence because the price was much lower and when I, I did go down there for a couple of meetings, people were very, very nice and the quality of work was excellent. Well, the book is pretty slick mm -hmm. for a self-published book and that, that I think indicates how much time and effort both of you put oh, into yeah, it. Time. Yes. But, um, it, you, you know, people who are creative, like both of you obviously are, are not going to stop now. You've got other projects oh, yeah. going on. Mm -hmm. Things, probably paperwork piled in places that we can't see in this. Mm -hmm. Well, I moved it before you got here, actually. Don't, if you we, can, wouldn't, we won't let you in, into our computer room. <laughs> well, That's really a mess. I have a place that most of my viewers and readers are familiar with called the River Room, which is my sanctuary mm -hmm. on the back of my house. And it does have a beautiful view out on the picturesque Saranac River in Morrisonville. But to get to the windows mm -hmm. could be a challenge. <laughs> there are always tape recorders and CD players and stacks and stacks of books and papers. Mm -hmm. And my, my, you know, our partnership is much like your partnership at my house. My wife supports everything that I do and some of my schemes are far way more far-fetched than yours are, I can <laughs> promise you that. But he knows where every scrap of paper is in my house. And if I need old photographs, I'm on the phone with somebody, and in 20 seconds she hands them to me from some nook or cranny. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful to have that kind of, the kind of support. But mm -hmm. I just mentioned that because, yes, my river room is more cluttered than Calvin's car. <laughs> Mm -hmm. he, he's like my dad used to be. He lives in his car, and so what you do is there. And I could, my dad would take me for a ride somewhere, and I'd say, "Where am I going to sit?" You know. All right, let's look at some photographs. Um, this is obviously you had to give people a reference point because at some point in time, people are going to look at this book who've never been to Lion Mountain. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, lots of them. Yes. And this is a picture of Lion Mountain. Is this an old picture or one that you took? That is one that I took. There's a, actually, I, I like the story behind this, too, because we were on our way back from Lion Mountain. And that's, for 30 years, that's been one of my favorite views. And um, you see the shape of the, the mountain oh, in the picture? Oh, absolutely. Well, when I was, the one thing I could not do, I've tried for, I'd say over two years, I think about this all the time at work, trying to design a cover. I finally found the picture that I thought would be excellent, but I didn't know what to do with all this. Well, the slope of the letters matches the slope of the mountain. Oh, come on. And that was Jill's creative idea, and it, as soon as I saw it, I loved it. That's, that, that was the first cover she did right there. And nowhere in the book does it say the shape of the letters. <laughs> no, but she is creative. You wanted to see if people would pick up on that. Well, of course I didn't. <laughs> well, I, That's just how dense I am. But I, I didn't either. <laughs> She but I have, to, I have to tell you, and when, you're, when you write something, you like to be a little subtle. Even when I write children's books, I, I do subtle things in the books because I know that some college humanities class is going to study that book at some point in time if I'm lucky. Mm -hmm. And they're going to look for the subtle things like we all discovered about Gulliver's Travels and how it wasn't really a children's book and, you know, it was a social commentary and satire and all of that. <coughs> People ask me, why did you mention that in a children's book? No child is going to get that. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe they will and maybe they won't, but it made me feel good to put it in there, and that's, that's beautiful. All right, but that's only page one. Mm -hmm. What other, uh, I'll, I'll, why don't you leaf through the book and pick out things that you want, want us to know about? Because we're talking about an extensive time period that, let's say, began mining in Lion Mountain from about 1873, have I gone back far enough? Well, they were mining some in the 18, late 1860s, but it was surface mining. It was very, very limited. That was, that was a, at a time when some of the men had to walk to work from Danamora, which is a long walk, but that's what they did. There were no homes there then. But the 1870s, things were going pretty good. Yeah, they started rolling along pretty well there. Um, and most of the memories of the people you talked to go up through, at least in the 1940s, well, when I interviewed the people in around 1980, most of them were around 80 years old. One was in her 90s, and Mrs. Victoria Robinson. And her connection was she had memories back around 1900, and her dad was one of the original miners, Eli Alexander. So we wow. went right back to the That's very... That's this whole spectrum then, isn't it? <laughs> and huh? he did. He did the walk from Dan Amora. 
So that was like the best connection of all right there, right back to the very beginning. Isn't that incredible? And she, the last time I interviewed her, I think she died a few months later. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, but I have spoken with her family. That's, and, that's the virtue of doing, of doing that and getting this on, on tape today. Uh, and these photographs are, every one of them except for the 30-some that Jill took are in private collections and not at the Feinberg. Did you find any photographs at Feinberg? Some of these come from a book done by J.R. Linney, who was oh, yes. who ran the company town. He, there was actually a report for the company in 1934, but he did cover the history of the mines, and that's where a lot of the photos come from. Uh, that would probably be owned now by C.P. Rail because they bought the company that used to own the mines. I, 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 it just dawns on me that since you interviewed these people, we should mention most of their names because there's no question about the fact that some of their family is going to be viewing this oh, program. Yeah, definitely. And if they're the spine or the backbone of this book, then we should mention who, who they are. I would say they are. I mean, there's tons of research, but the interviews, I really like to let people talk let them say it the way it was, and that's what I did here. I did quote them extensively, but nobody could say it better than they could. They were there. Um, now, from the Linney side, Mildred Linney Blanche, that's, she's gone now. She, that was Jerry Blanche's wife. Jerry Blanche was one I, we interviewed, and... And J.R. Linney's daughter. And, right, J.R. Linney's daughter. And we have been to see Jerry just, uh, the last time we were there was Saturday, Saturday. morning. He's still... Still in great shape. I think he's 86 years old. Ha, Still a it. tough guy. He's got some great connections in this book. Um, Floyd Bracy, I met through a friend of mine at YF. It was uh, his dad. He was a miner. He was um, Floyd was probably one of the best known drillers because you were supposed to work in teams, but he was the tough guy that worked alone. He, you know, he said he made more money that way. But um, John Bracy, his son, John's gone now. Also, he died young. Rufus Bricky. Who his claim to fame would be uh, he was on the champion championship bobsled team, and I interviewed him. Um, George Davies lived in Standish. He worked mostly on the railroad and at the furnace in Standish. Fred Pagel um, and Marjorie, his wife. Um, one of Fred's stories in here is that he suffered a really serious injury. He explained the whole thing about what happened to him. Oliver Pavetta, he used to run the... Uh, the beer garden, and he was a tough guy. <laughs> he showed me some tricks he used to use as a bouncer. Um, a <laughs> <laughs> I uh, love it. He was a great bowler, too. Um, Victoria Robinson, who I mentioned, was 91 when I interviewed her. Um, Teddy Rounds, his real name is Leonard, and he was a baseball star back in the 30s. And sure his son, was. His son's in the 50s. Legendary, yeah. Yeah, his sons were great also. Ed Secor was another uh, miner that I interviewed, and um, Anthony Plank Terrasavage. Was, oh, yeah. he was he was one of the very best interviews. Well, I have to there. tell people that if if they never had a chance to meet Plank, they never had a chance to listen to people who knew him or had any contact with him as I have, then you should read this book. And I don't want to discredit any of the other interviews because <coughs> they're all wonderful, but his are the best because he was a distinct and unique personality. And we talk about tough guys that we've known in our lifetime. And I wrote a column, not that I want to keep referring to my own column, but I wrote about a, f a few weeks ago about the strong men I've known in my life and why I've made a point of trying to stay in physical shape, you know, here in the <coughs> North Country because I've been associated with strong men like my dad. Plank Terra Savage. Yeah, he was a powerful man. Was unbelievable yeah. and powerful in so many ways. And his presence in a room commanded attention. Some people, like the king and queen, can mm -hmm. command attention <laughs> when they walk in a room. Plank Terra Savage was one of those guys. Oh, definitely. When now I mentioned curse words, there he may have had a few in there, but <laughs> well, he knew he, what words suited. It's, it's what told what the story, word, really. He knew what words suited the occasion, and I have to tell our viewers that I worked for many years at the local radio station with uh, Ann Tara Savage, who was and is the s sales manager there, whose husband is Mike Tara Savage, who grew up in Lion Mountain, and he's the son of Plank Tara Savage. And Mike was and is a pretty tough guy, and has worked, he's my age, and I'm really old, 
and he's worked on construction most of his life as well and he's been in, injured in a form of mining working in the down in the in the tunnels in New York City building tunnels underground so that's a whole other part of it but I've had that connection with mm -hmm. with Plank and Lillian and yeah. and the whole family so that you know, I can just, I can feel your emotion as you're interviewing these people because it's like doing this kind of an interview when you're interested in history and love to write is like having a full course meal and being a glutton as I am in food and having it placed before you because every bite, every word, every phrase mm -hmm. is delicious, right? Really, with him, I mean, I, w I was mesmerized. Just once he started, I gave him a list. I had researched as many mind deaths as I possibly could find. And as he was talking, I just took the list and I turned it around in front of him and he started to go through it. And that was, that's probably one of my favorite parts of the book. And I know it, it brought up emotions in some people that are reading it. That, you know, it, it hurts to remember how dad or grandpa died, but Plink was just matter of fact, you know, to say that we set up the drill and all of a sudden a huge slab of rock just came down and there were pancakes left. That's how he put it. And he said, when you did search and rescue, sometimes you'd use tweezers and a dustpan. You know, and this was reality for them. Just, but that's how he told the story. And really, virtually everybody I talked to while I interviewed them, they would come to tears, but just keep talking through it. With modern safety requirements and features, there are far and far less mining accidents mm -hmm. in the United States than there are in other countries. And I don't want to pick out one in particular, but we've seen some terrible mining disasters in China. Mm -hmm. recently where a lot of people die because the standards are not as high as they are. <coughs> um, o OSHA hadn't even been dreamed of mm. when, <laughs> when mining started back in those days and you had to do things by your brain and your brawn. Right. And those are the two words that fit guys like Plink Tara Savage and it's only because of their brain and their brawn that he survived and I don't know how old was he when he died? I don't recall. He was in his 70s, wasn't he? I think he? he was in his late 60s when I interviewed him. He was one of the He was in his 70s years. when he died, and you mm -hmm. say, how could a man live that long having been through that much? Right, there weren't very many old miners. When you go to find an old miner, uh, there's not many of them. As everywhere. Even back then, there's only one or two right now, actually. Any other class? I want to look, since this is a visual medium, and I sometimes forget that, having been on the radio for all those years, um, even though people will never get tired of seeing Jill's face, Larry and I will. Mm, yeah, I get tired of it myself. <laughs> so let's look at some pictures, and just uh, the pictures that you enjoy, and that you think might might uh, help to well, tell the story. This one here. All right, that's, that's I'll, hold, one. I'll hold it up, and Calvin will focus on it. And while he is, you tell me all about it. Well, that's Lion Mountain Village in 1885. Um, you can see the, the dirt roads. And back then, of course, there were no sewage systems or anything, so things just ran out into the gutters. And um, you can see it's a tough, tough area. And some of those buildings may still be in existence? Yes. Some of the, some of the people there told me that some are still encased within a home. They've been built over. That's a good point and I want to make that out because I know the Standish Road and others have a lot of homes and inside the walls of those homes are logs mm -hmm. because they were originally log homes and log cabins. Mm -hmm. Some were moved but some stayed on that spot mm -hmm. were built onto. Yeah, they built right over some of them. Yeah. Oh, and this, I love that. All right. That's just, I'll, it's hard to fathom that it was there, that a trestle built that high. Explain it to our viewers. Well, that was, what year does it say? 18, 1880. And they had to get the trains up to this level. There was no other way than to just build up higher and higher. So this looks like it's actually three levels high right here. And again, that, that was a small photo that Jill made into this because um, I couldn't do it. And she did it under pressure. And it's really an excellent photo. You're good under pressure, uh, aren't you? She did a great job. She, if, if everybody saw what she had to work with. Did you... <coughs> actually learn a lot about the mining process in doing this book? Yes, mostly just from from the miners themselves. I wasn't I wasn't too concerned. I didn't want to just write the specifics of how it was done. Uh, but the information is there for people that want to find it. It is available in different places. Um, but mostly I wanted to know what the men actually did, hands-on job. 
Just for the people who live in Lion Mountain now, who have no idea what it looked like when mining was thriving, it's fun to include pictures of what Lion Mountain mm -hmm. looked like in the late 1800s and early 1900s during this time period. And we're fortunate that, that many of these photographs still exist. And what they've done, many people up there copy them and pass them on to friends. Here's a person whose name we've already dropped yes. about 16 times so far in our show, but why was he so important? Well, Lion Mountain was, even into the 1915, 16, 17 time period, was a wild west town. There were frequent murders, crimes went unpunished, uh, gangs, fights, all kinds of violence. And this man was brought in to try to clean it up. And I guess he did, but um, not to everyone's satisfaction. <laughs> you know, the town has their feelings about it because Lion Mountain is extremely unusual. It, it became a company town, which is much more common in the coal mining areas like Virginia and Pennsylvania. But that's what Lion Mountain became. So um, one of my favorite trivia questions is uh, name, name a past mayor of Lion Mountain. Now, you can't name any government official. The company ran it. They owned everything and they ran everything. Now, if we were clever, we'd have a musical background and we'd have Tennessee Ernie Ford singing yeah. 16 that tons and right what there. do you get? Yes. You owe your soul to the company store. Mm -hmm. But that's the way it really yeah, was. That's the way it was, yes. Um, I'll show these two pictures for a couple of reasons. Every job has its own nomenclature, its own set of terms that is unique. We call it shop talk. Mm -hmm. And these, you're mentoring, mentioning things in these pictures that, that many of our people have never heard of. But when you talk to these guys, these words roll off their tongues like it's part of their everyday vocabulary. Yeah. Because it is. It is, yes. Right? Talking about drilling in a stope, for example, you know, and the shaft head frame, right? Right. This is, they used to hoist the ore up in that, in that area, in the head frame. I'm sure you visited Lion Mountain many, many times. What still exists? What can can people see up closer from a distance today if they were to visit Lion Mountain? Oh, boy, I'm not really sure because I'm not sure if you're actually supposed to go in where the buildings are. I may have accidentally gone in there a few times. No! <laughs> I want that to, I just uh, wanted that to get down so that the liability is all covered. Yeah, I was never actually caught. <laughs> well, I gotta tell you that I've done the same. Kay and I are so interested in history, and even though we seem like these very peace-loving, law-abiding citizens, we've been known to crawl in spaces where mm. man their beast was not fit to go. We've been kicked out of what historic buildings and places I'm not even going to mention for obvious reasons now, trying to investigate what were in attics and cellars of abandoned buildings that we knew were a part of uh, New York mm -hmm. State history. <coughs> <coughs> Never, ever with any intent to destroy anything, but just to gain knowledge by mm -hmm. being there and touching Well, things. actually, some of the buildings that I first saw, you know, and this technically wasn't an interview, but Bill Gonzalez was oh, a friend yeah. of mine from, from Wyeth. And we would talk about everything at work, and Lion Mountain is where he lived, and it was a, you know, a very important subject to him, and that's, that's where all this book actually grew from. And back in maybe 1981 or 82, he took me on a tour of some of the buildings, and uh, the most special part to me was when we went up the old railroad bed to some of the mines. There was an open pit mine. There was one they referred to as Jake Tulowski's pit. And I think it's across from there <laughs> was the, the Greenwater mine, which yep. is famous for different things. But, I mean, I'll never forget in the middle of July looking down into this, looked like kind of a semicircular hole, and there's huge chunks of ice down there in the middle of July that you could see right from the top. Now, he took me on a tour probably two or three times of different areas up there. I will, I have not looked down into many of the mines up there. But I have been to Palmer Hill Caves in the days when, when uh, it was all, you know, pedestrians were, mm -hmm. were trespassers were always <laughs> discouraged, but many people went there and God knows how many things fell down into there. But just looking in those caves and feeling the difference in air temperature and having the luxury of meeting uh, James J. Rogers III, whom I worked with in the radio business for a long, long time, and having him talk about his famous family, oh, yeah. That's and a gold mine right taking there. Rogers up into the mines, 
uh, before he died. Here's another little <coughs> photograph, and these pictures to me are always fascinating because I spend a lot of time promoting music in our schools and music in general because I think it's a vital part of our lives, either playing, performing, or enjoying listening to music. And here we have yeah, that, the that, Lion Mountain Band. Yes, now that that picture appears in the church. The church did a book called Mining for Souls a long time ago, and that I picture was in there. Mining for Souls. Yeah, My title. mother and father would have loved that title. Well, that would be the band as it was when J.R. Linney was there, but what a lot of people probably didn't know was that at least 40 years previous to that, the band was uh, a really popular thing in Lion Mountain. They formed their own band and they played at all different social events in, in the 1880s. So it precedes this, but this became much more famous. This is a band that was actually playing concerts to three or four thousand people and they were once conducted by John Philip Sousa for, for a song. Oh, so isn't that, that a nice, that was nice a little piece yeah. of history? Just to drop a name that's familiar to every man, yes. woman, and child. I believe that's in the church book. They but the know. fact is that they all have uniforms, mm -hmm. that there's an ancient bus behind them, which you may not see the first time you look at it, but there's a rack on the top with a bass drum and mm -hmm. an old car next to them. And, and it's hard to see it, but it does say Lion Mountain Boys Band across the side. Uh, I see it now that it's you mentioned. Very hard to see. Glad it. you pointed it out because I'm old and it's front of <laughs> in front of the post office and a store that's a Lion Mountain something. Yeah, I did. Jill enlarged that actually so we could at least read that much. You know, you can feel free to jump in. Just <laughs> I'm not I'm not avoiding you on purpose, but it's anytime okay. you want to. What was it like trying to work with these photographs? It was actually kind of fun. Um, some of it got a little tedious because some of them needed a lot of retouching. But uh, for the most part, it was very enjoyable. Was this learn as you go for you, or did you already spend a lot of time working with photographs like this? Um, not so much with photographs, actually. Um, I work with computers a lot, so I'm usually pretty good at figuring out computer software. But as far as photos, yes, I was fairly <coughs> into it. So you did learn as you go, mm -hmm. and you find out that really the computer will do a lot of things. Yeah, you can make your great. I love you can computers. make your <laughs> fingers move right. Um, this is a picture, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. And we'll, we'll still try to add 900 words <laughs> or so to every picture. But this is uh, Lenny's camp yes. on Shattergate Lake. Mm -hmm. We all know what has happened in the recent, in the last 20 or 30 years around Shazy Lake and Shattergate Lake, right? Mm -hmm. But what they don't know is that Shattergate Lake and in the early days was very much connected with mining mm -hmm. and mining wow. and, and the camps were for mining families for the yeah. most part, right? Right. The forge was up at the um, the north end and that's where they used to haul the ore to the, the forge to be worked there. 90, uh, 1937 was a good year because it happens to be the year in which I was born. <laughs> and uh, you know, when we refer to some of these camps, we're talking about some pretty luxurious yeah, this places, and for 67 years ago, that's a, not a bad yeah. camp, well, right? The company manager. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, you know, you know. Um, wow, this gives you a long view of the what they call a concentrating plant. There's a lot of aspects of uh, the mining process that I'm not familiar with, in spite of the fact that we've interviewed quite a few miners ourselves over the years. So I have no idea what concentrating means, but we can see that it was an extensive operation, yeah. huh? Right, and it flows, you can see it flows downhill. It's uh, step by step to remove the Just impurities. Just remember this, it always flows downhill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, who, you can't talk about mining. You can't talk about... Lion Mountain, without mentioning Standish. Right, the furnace at Standish, that's, uh, everyone knows about uh, it. It's, a lot of these communities, Standish I wouldn't call a ghost town, although I would say that I'm indebted to Marjorie Lansing Porter for supplying me with a map of the dozens of ghost towns that existed back in the early 60s when I came here, and I'd love to explore as many of those as I could find. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah, there were communities which don't exist anymore except for the foundations and the lilac trees near where their garbage dump was behind the house. Mm -hmm. uh, but Standish is still a community, 
but it's not the bustling community as it was that it was circa 1933 and before for sure. <coughs> um, here's another word that people might not be familiar with, but we're going to tell you about the sintering plant, right? Well, I, I wish we could. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fact that that's what it was. Yeah. Let people let the people get their plant. own fun funkin' <laughs> Wagners out to get the the details. The Z, uh, these are all photographs that you had to do a little uh, work mm -hmm. with? Yes. First of all, you had to make it the right size. Mm -hmm. Yes, there were some that he would have liked to have had full page, but you have to preserve what they call the aspect ratio. Because if you just if you just decided, well, I have this picture that's shaped like this, and I want to make it a long um, photograph full page, it's not going to look right. It's going to distort your image. So um, That's pretty easy to he do. He gave that. me an idea of what photos he wanted full page. And if I could make it full page, I would crop it a certain way and ask him if he, if he liked it well enough. If not, we had to make it a partial page. You know, the aspect is very important, and that it's not, a, uh, it's not just a technicality. Because people who might be familiar with some of these things would, would not be happy with a distorted view. Mm. You know, if you it, tried to uh, shorten somebody and make, make them look short and <laughs> fat. Especially when you're talking to a person. And I've tried that because yeah. I do a lot of line drawings. I would never call myself an artist. But I draw thousands and thousands of line drawings, and I've scanned them and, and enlarged them and shortened them and mm -hmm. try to make them look better by <coughs> distorting them. But I had to do a lot of math with this because I had to keep my, um, whatever size the picture went in, I had to make sure to keep it in that same proportion. So and she's a math Luckily, whiz. my math and that's came what, in handy that's there, That's what too. math whizzes do. <laughs> and I, I apologize to the world <coughs> of civil engineering because when I was in high school, I was a math whiz. Uh, but in spite of trying to assist all the kids that we raised in their math over the years, I realized how much I lost by not using any of those math skills throughout my life because right. I, I really haven't needed them for very much. But thank goodness you maintained <coughs> yours. There's a good example of a company town right there with the, um, the row houses, which is a very common feature. And if it's a mining town, the uh, tailings, there's two large piles of tailings in the background. Well, the tailings are an important part of the process, and they remain hmm. for years and sometimes yes. centuries after oh, yes. it's finished. And, you know, I've been on uh, doodle bugs and four-wheel drive vehicles before they were three-wheelers and four-wheelers, up mm -hmm. and down those piles of tailings and up the old railroad beds and up on the top of Lowenberg. And don't ever ask my wife Kay what her trip was like to the top of that mountain one time with me with an old international scout you know, trying to follow my son-in-law in a doodle bug he made from a Volkswagen. Uh, but there were there were tears shed on the way up and on the way down because it was very dangerous and I was way, way, way too crazy. Um, you mentioned row houses and the company, we talked about the company store. There's the company store there in that photo. Another very important part of a company town. They did have script there at one time at Lion Mountain, so you didn't get paid with cash. You were paid with um, what people referred to as coupons, and you had to spend them in the company store. Very clever <laughs> aspect of of controlling everything there was about your life. Yes. Mm -hmm. When I say the company controlled your life, I'm not kidding. You know, you gave every every part of your body to that company, and they owned you waking and. Waking and sleeping, and uh, when we say script, for people who may not have any idea what we're talking about, we're talking about money. That's what you spent there, and you couldn't go down and you couldn't go down and spend it at Merkel's in downtown no. Plattsburgh no. either. Although there was a time when you could spend wooden nickels around when they were celebrating with those advertising gimmicks, but not not script from Lion Mountain. No, I mean, and that was a, a thriving business for them, I think. Somewhere in there, in one of the years around 1882 or 83, one month, $14,000 worth of business when, you know, a, a nickel was a lot of money. That's a huge business, and people had to spend it there. So they paid people, but they made it right back. Too. Isn't that incredible? You want to see what a mine, what it, the open mine looked like? Oh, that is... 50, 53 years ago? That came from Jerry Blanche. That is um, supposed to be the original mine... The 81 mine, they used to refer to it as, it's near Standish. It was an open pit mine back then, and it was used 
several times over the years, but the rest of them became underground tunnels. So that's where it started. Yes, that's one of the very original mines. That's a list right here of the company town components that generally exist. And Lion Mountain had many of them. That's interesting just to scan that list if Kelvin can do that. I, I found it fascinating as I was leafing through the book on this side. It's and you know, it is true that the, the company owned everything. On the one hand, they provided everything, so people did have a nice store, they had a nice school. They might have a racetrack or a nice ball field, but still, this is America, and nobody owned anything except the company. It, that's to I, I, If we don't get anything else over in this interview, I think it's important to know that this is how it worked. Mm -hmm. The company ran the show, and you were a pawn of the company, and, and you, you know, worked very hard, and your whole family was involved, and... Well, the different companies that owned it, it, it was still conducted the same way, and they had, that's what really impressed me. When I went around trying to first meet people, I had a list of people to meet to try to do interviews, and Ed Secor, I will never forget, going to the door, and I told him what I was doing, and he was nice, but he, his first comment was, you can't, his words were, you can't make the book, you can't make the book, and I, I said, well, why can't I make the book? He said, the company won't let you. He said, the company's going to come after you. And I, I had to tell him, you know, I'm not from Lion Mountain. There's no more company. It's, um, Isn't that incredible? It was gone 13 or 14 years before that. But Isn't was, that incredible? I'm so glad you thought of that to make that statement today because that's profound. Yes. You know, you're talking 13 or 14 years later, he was afraid of the company, the power of the company. And wow. There was none. Yeah, well, a few people, actually. Some didn't talk to me because of that. They were afraid. Well, when you describe it in the book as, uh, you know, especially Linney's tenure there, mm -hmm. his quarter of a century as the most controversial period in Lion Mountain history, that's an understatement. Yes. Uh, but for people who, who know, who lived it, and are, who read it, like this gentleman, you said it's not at all an understatement. Mm. They, they were and, afraid. And I can understand where certain aspects of this book might have been written with a no small amount of trepidation, not only on your part, but on those people who were supplying the information for all the reasons you've mentioned and some that we don't even dare to get involved in. Yes. There, there was a, always a fear factor. Yes, definitely, and it, it was just hard to believe it would last that long, but it did. Um, well, the company had so much power over you that if most people there will still tell you, if you were injured, injured severely, um, you probably just had to leave because the houses were owned by the company and the houses were for healthy miners. And if you couldn't mine anymore, you would hope they would set you up somewhere else, but it, that wasn't always the case. I mean, not, not just with Linny. Previous to Linny, there were people that were kicked out of town for different reasons. And if you couldn't work, you couldn't have a home. Simple as that. Wow. Think about that. Jill, you spent some time in the cemetery. Yes. One cemetery or more? Um, well, there's a St. Bernard's has a, its own cemetery behind it, and then off to one side is the cemetery for the Methodist Church. So I guess technically it's two cemeteries, but they're right there together, so it's one stop. And what was your purpose in doing that? Um, he really wanted to get the point across to people just how many men died in the mines. And to do that, he thought that taking pictures of some of the gravestones in the cemetery would uh, accomplish that goal. So we went up there and took pictures of various men. He had a list. He actually had compiled a large list of um, many of the men who died, when they died, how they died, and things <coughs> like that. And we went and hunted down their stones and took pictures. Were you surprised <coughs> yeah, about how many men were killed? I mean, there were some statistics, but they weren't always right, the public statistics. Yeah, most of what I got from the miners, they would name a few people that died. but. Um, you know that trespassing thing you mentioned? Well, <laughs> there's various aspects that come into play. I, I at one point, and I was much younger then, but I did talk my way into um, some town records, which it was death records, and it, it didn't just include mines. But what they wanted from me was a name so they could look up the record for me. And I said, well, I don't have a name. I want to know the names. So fortunately, I believe the person in charge was out of the office, and this other person did let me in, and that's where I accumulated 
my first list. I read a hundred years of newspapers, probably two or three different newspapers, every single day to try to find anything about people dying in the mines. And then you had to branch out, of course, to Chateaugay because someone that died in Lion Mountain might be from Chateaugay or Dannemora. But um, they did tell me they thought a lot of men died, but I don't think any, I, I know nobody knows how many because you would have to do everything I did to find out. There were, there were well over 150 that died in various accidents. Yeah, well, I would say, based on what people have told me, well over 150. You know, you have a, you have a chapter called The Town of Immigrants, and, you know, we talk about our nation as a melting pot, a mm -hmm. potpourri, if you will, of, of different nationalities. Mm -hmm. And that would not have been more evident than when you went into the cemetery and saw some of these strange European and Russian names. Mm -hmm. And um, Did you have to get any translations done? Yes, there's um, a professor at UVM that I, I contacted for, for just one or two. Um, yeah, I, was, I couldn't tell which part of the stone was the name. All you could tell was the year, and that was it. I did a few translations via the internet, but it's not as easy as you would think. So, I, uh, but there was a very interesting mixture mixture of immigrants involved in the mining process from the beginning right to mm -hmm. the end. Yes, I mean some of those families still exist around yes. here. Yes, I mean most people know about Sweden up in Lion Mountain, but to try to find somebody from Sweden now, um, you'd be hard pressed. There's very very few. So why do we have a place called Rouge Hill, which mm -hmm. is really Russia. Why do we have Russia and New Russia? Yeah. And why? And, and where does this place tie into the whole picture? Well, this is where they came through. Oh, you've got Ellis Island? Yes, yes. I do. And that may be a picture that many of our viewers are not familiar with. Having been there many times, I'm most familiar with that photograph and interested very interested in that process and how many of these people came to our country. You know, my mother used to call it a lick and a promise, and yeah. they didn't have any money. No. They may have left their entire family behind to come here and seek their no, their they, fortune. They have they have put many of the records online, and boy, isn't it amazing? Fortunately, now, huh? <laughs> I was digging, and I I got lucky just uh, a couple of months ago. Actually, this is Dominic Blanche. That was. Jerry the Jerry Rogers Plants father. that I mentioned, yes. that was his dad. And um, Jerry's uncle Jerry was also in Lion Mountain, and there were several others. I had researched um, the boarding houses. Some boarding houses had 40 people living in them. It's a huge number, with, you know, maybe 20 beds, 40 people. And originally Jerry had told me that his last name, Blanche, had been Americanized. He thought it was at Ellis Island. And he said he, he was trying to recall at the time, and he said he thought Blancotti. And I, have, I do have that in writing, but when we visited him recently, he used R instead of the L. He said Brancotti, and he was sure of it. So as I was searching Ellis Island, I actually came up with one of his family members living in, last known to have lived in Lion Mountain, and I told him about it. He was pretty excited. He's, he's pretty proud of his heritage anyway. Doing that kind of research is almost as fun as going out and digging a hole somewhere and finding yeah, a pot nice. of gold, because that's in essence what it is. Mm -hmm. Just to give you an idea was li what life was like in some of these uh, steamships when mm -hmm. people came to America. I mean, you've, most of our viewers have read the bit about slavery and how people had terrible conditions when the slave ships came over from Africa and elsewhere, but this gives you a, an idea yes, of what life was simple. like in the holds of these steamships because, you know, you couldn't book a... You couldn't book a, a a stateroom on the Titanic. <laughs> For most no. of these people were lucky to get on on a steamship that was carrying cargo, you know? Yes. Um, I don't know if people, this is, this changing house is one of my favorite photographs, although it's, the the contrast is, makes it not too clear as to yeah. what's there, but tell people what It is difficult to see, but when the miners, miners had to change and, you know, you had to have protective clothing, you had to have uh, waterproof clothing to go into the mines because it was very, very cold and very damp. And it was a constant temperature, but not a warm temperature. And it was very wet. Some, it may have been Plink telling me that you had to sometimes wear two suits and you'd still be wet and cold. And you'd only stay warm from working. We've, uh, we've done some interviews, some of the old miners and their families down in Port, Port Henry. Mm -hmm. uh, and They've got a nice little museum. 
that they set up a few years ago down there, and we've talked to a number of the people involved. And it, you know, talking to those people, it's it's like opening the book, mm -hmm. the audio book, and getting it. And as you said, it's so much better to do it this way than to have you do all the research and to tell it in your words. Don't right. you think? Yeah. I mean, I, I like to write, but I like to listen. And you can't say it better than what they said. You wouldn't want to paraphrase it. Not at all. Um, now, some of those photos were done by a company called, it was Albert Type, right? Albert Type. I yes. always forget that name. They, it was um, a company back oh, in the um, pre-1900 era. I think they went into around 1930. They would just travel around to different businesses and photograph people on the job, and they're sold as postcards. I found a few in oh, Woodstock, Vermont. Oh yes, I had forgotten that. Yeah. And so they well, they I'll did put my finger here. on on one of these photographs because it actually shows some of the miners and mentions their names. And this is one of those photographs from that company, you believe? I think. I think it might have been. Um, I think Jill corrected me on it. I thought it was yesterday, actually, and she told me that that one was from. I know Rita. we definitely got it from Nita Question, but I don't recall now if it was. That may be part of a postcard or just a photograph that she had. Yeah, because she had several of those postcards. So what Jill had, oftentimes, was a small faded postcard and <laughs> produced some of these photos. Well, the the cover photo came from a postcard. Yes. Did it really? Yes. Yeah. I was, uh, I've been so fortunate because since I in, enjoy history and write about it as you do, people will drop off a bag of old postcards that they don't want at my house and I'm like a little <laughs> child yeah. in a candy <coughs> store and I'm going through these photographs of these wonderful photographs of, of this area, downtown mm -hmm. Plattsburgh and stores that were there and so on. Let's just show a loaded ore car in the, uh, on this page here. Right, and that's the chute where the ore actually comes down. You you lift the beam and let the car fill with ore. And that was the site of many, many accidents, many deaths. Well, you know, the mining business has been glamorized by Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And many of the things you see and hear about mining, and with a few notable exceptions, are, are, when I say glamorized, I chose that word on purpose because it doesn't even begin to show the conditions the way they oh, really no. were. There were documentary films done in the coal mines of Pennsylvania, about the coal mines of Pennsylvania and some of the tremendous battles that went on down there. But we had similar things happening up here, as you mentioned mm -hmm. early in our interview. And so life wasn't just a matter of going down and doing your job and going home at night and invaded every part of your body. Um, and every part of your existence with your family. <coughs> There's an underground locomotive that I find that fascinating picture. These were massive pieces of mm -hmm. powerful, powerful I, I, pieces of equipment. I believe that's from the Albert type. Po isn't that one of the postcards? I believe so. Did these miners that you interviewed talk about not just the accidents, but about what the conditions were, like the breathing conditions and how they could tell whether the air was safe to breathe in the mine or... Well, um, the book that was done by J.R. Lenny points out that they were very fortunate. They had natural ventilation. There were openings where the fumes could escape and you always had cool air with the ice. You always had cool air in there. So that part was good at least, but the um, most of the mines were very wet. They ran pumps all the time to keep them clear of water so you could do your work. It was um, terrible conditions, I think, most of it. Well, by today's standards, of course, the conditions were terrible. Yeah, I mean, the guys, some workers refer to as, you said glamorous, muckers would not be a glamorous word. No. Um, when they would first set their charges and dynamite the wall, these muckers would have to go in, or used to be the drillers did it themselves. You'd have to go in and pick up all of that ore and load it into wheelbarrows and wheel it out, and eventually there were trains or there were mules that used to haul it back then. They kept mules underground because if you took them up they'd go blind from the brightness. They were just kept underground all the time. Isn't that? Mm. That's interesting. I never really thought about that. Yeah, this would be Something else we haven't mentioned but I, since we're doing a, a little historical retrospective <laughs> through the eyes, through your eyes, the eyes of these miners in this book, uh, it's there's an interesting story as to why Lion Mountain was chosen for mining in the first place. 
This was a very special kind of ore they had up there. Right. I mean, uh, I know one of the photos that I've seen shows the, uh, I think it was 1893, the World's Fair Award for high quality ore. There you go. But it, but it was, it was a, there was no better ore in the whole world. No better iron ore. It was extremely pure. That's why they used it for special purposes. It was good for anything, but it was especially good. I know they did say for surgical instruments and fine things like that. Yeah, it was. Um, it was always considered among the very best. This is uh, this is kind of cool because hmm. I have a hat in my hanging up in my garage among all the millions of pieces of memorabilia that I've collected over the years from the uh, West Virginia coal mines. Oh, really? That is not dissimilar from this one, and we've seen this. A similar hat and lamp on display in that little museum that I just mentioned to you down at Port Henry. If our viewers have not been there, they ought to go there because aside from this book and a few other places, there aren't really enough uh, museums that in the North Country that focus on the mining aspect, which was a, you know, a huge part of what life was like during oh, that, a yes. long, long period of time. There will be another museum, hopefully soon, in Lion Mountain. Well, let's let's talk about that I, I, while we look at another piece of equipment here. Go ahead. Well, actually, yeah, that's how I connected with Rita Quetchen. I had, I had saved articles from the Press Republican that mentioned Rita Quetchen and Jim Humiston was another name that they were working on putting a museum together and they were doing different fundraisers. And um, it is coming along. Rita's offered to actually take us in and show us what it looks like now, but not finished yet. But they are working on it. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. That's those things are labors of love. Mm -hmm. And I might mention you might you might think, well, wow, Larry, uh, is going to make a fortune on this book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, what he's going to make on this book compared to the number of hours he spent gathering the information. Um, Maybe it will amount to three or four cents an hour. Maybe. <laughs> With any luck. And this is, and you didn't write this book to make a fortune on it. You did it because it was a quest. We all go through life with these quests. You had a passion for this. You've obviously started at least to satiate that passion by gathering this information, talking to these people. And you both, both of you, have gone through an experience that can't be replaced or substituted for in any other way but to get into it. Right, I mean, the, the elderly, that's where the information is, and you know, I've learned that, and that's where I like to do my interviews. I gotta tell you, <laughs> I gotta tell you that this particular truck, not that individual truck, but that class of trucks, uh, uh, touches a soft spot in my heart. And why is that? The Euclid truck, affectionately known as the uke, was a big part of my construction years. And I don't often talk about all the wild and crazy things I did in my youth, but I worked on construction for a long time, including the building of the St. Lawrence Seaway. And thanks to that project and building of Plattsburgh Air Force Base, I was able to, to go to college for six years. Uh, you know, my parents had no money. And watching these big ukes work, all the time and just being truly amazed not at their size and being blown away by the guys who would climb up into that cab and actually be able to drive one without running over somebody or something. <laughs> and one of my um, most poignant memories is when they were working on the Eisenhower lock on one of these trucks under the hood. And my brother and I were down inside the hole if you ever go to Eisenhower Lock, you have to realize that that was once a huge, deep hole. Somehow they started this truck inadvertently with a screwdriver across some contacts under the hood, and the tr truck took off on its own, wiped out a swath of cars in the parking lot, and came over my head, bouncing down the hill into the hole. And like these stories, that's not as dramatic as some of the stories you heard, mm. But for a young guy working on construction, I did question my very existence for a moment or two. And there were, uh, there were elements of my body that were functioning beyond my control. <laughs> it's the most delicate way I can yeah. put it. 
Well, and I was afraid that some people were, were dead. And because the good Lord or whatever being you believe in that is larger than we are, we overlooked my brother and I that night and all the other people there, not one person was injured or hurt. The truck never rolled over. The truck did manage to bounce between the forms that they were pouring and so didn't even cause any damage except all those poor people who had no car to go home in the next morning. <laughs> so anyway, that's the uke. Um, this one I don't know if you can see, but the caption is worth reading anyway, right here, because you talk about... Go ahead. It, it probably ties in pretty well with the photo next to it of the pillar, because <clears throat> most of the... Well, many of the earlier deaths that I found in the newspapers were from the ceiling just collapsing. And in the old days, you drilled down. You kept working down, 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 and that means the ceiling kept getting higher. You couldn't see it. And just one day while you're working, rocks would fall and crush people. And that's, um, you know, they'd pull out of the mines for a few days and just send everybody back in. Uh, I think this is a good picture because it, it's, a, it's a picture that's not unfamiliar. It gives a good reference point for, for many of our viewers who have seen things, timbers, shaped like this in mines, yes, in gold mines and silver mines and, and coal mines and mm -hmm. iron mines all over the country. And but that's what held it together. Right, and the significance here is that's what the tracks are supposed to look like. And on the next page, there's a man standing with the tracks up around his knees. And that's from one of the most feared events in the mines, the rock burst. Some call it an air blast, but miners refer to it as a, as a rock burst where the ground just seems to explode from underneath you. And that's, um, that could be the number one cause of death up there, actually. What causes, what causes that? Does anybody know? Well, some of the current, the websites that I've looked at now, they do try to explain it, like in Sweden and different areas. They think they've analyzed why it happens, but it happens so many times. Sometimes people were walking, that was considered a safe area, and the ground just exploded and it threw them into the rocks and killed them. We mentioned it already, but I want to show just a picture of a couple. I don't want to show every picture in the book because mm -hmm. I want to <laughs> wet people's appetites. But either or both of these pictures, you know, we're talking about Kowalski and mm -hmm. Tara Savage and yeah. some of these other other names. Huh? Kowalski. Kowalski is one of the most famous names up there, yes. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Well, I, I was concerned about... I decided to do this because I wanted to somehow show them about how many people had died there. So I do mention that the stones that are there represent about one-fifth. But it's been well received, at least. You can see some of them are in Italian, some are in Russian. Polish and Russian. Now, as we uh, get ready to wrap up our session here today, I just want to ask you, both of you, what what has meant, what's the most significant, I'll start with you, Jill, and it's appropriate that I should. What, what has affected you personally most about your efforts with this book? What sticks in your mind? What will be with you when you're the age of some of these, these miners when they were interviewed? Um, I think mainly just what all the people, you realize what all of these people went through, um, the hard times they faced, and how they got through it. Many of them lost loved ones, or they had to go to work every day knowing that they could be next, knowing that they might not come out of the mines that night and go home. So it just, it really makes you think about, you know, how good you ha how good we have it here today, knowing how hard those people had to work. Uh, so your role was not just working with pictures. You worked with text too, right? Somewhat. I did some editing, but, um, you know, he, he did Early. all the writing. He, uh, <coughs> he's the... As we like to say for our business oh here, I'm the brains, he's the talent. I, <laughs> I do all the technical I things, the photos touch and the website that. and things like that. No, you can with cut that out, right? Fork. <laughs> I wouldn't touch just, that with a fork. Just put one of those Anna Gooley clips in there and cover that up. <laughs> uh, my, my point is that you cannot undertake a project like this without it having a gross effect on who you are for the rest of your lives. And if I don't mind, inter if you don't mind me interjecting another personal note here, I believe when you touch photographs, when you handle photographs, mm -hmm. when you scan photographs, make them larger or smaller, or anything you did with those photographs, that part of what's in that photograph becomes a part of who you are 
by a process which I'm not sure I totally understand, but I try to. And I just, that's what I wanted you to feel, to tell me that you can, and you did express it quite well, <coughs> that you, you feel what some of those people feel when you touch a uh, photograph. Mm -hmm. And some, in some measure when you even touch a reproduction of that photograph in this book. So, it was an enjoyable, sometimes frustrating, uh, process. Uh, this won't be the last one of its kind that you're involved in, I have a feeling. No, we hope not. As for you, now that you've had all this time to think about the same question? Well, it's partially the same answer. It's the incredible toughness, the, men the mental toughness, not just physical, the mental toughness that it took, like when someone described for me, we're standing side by side, setting up for work, and you're talking with your friend, and then a huge 20-foot slab of ceiling falls, and he's gone. Two seconds later, there's nothing. I don't know how they dealt with that, and they returned to work. You know, like, like they said, the whistle would blow. People knew that it wasn't lunchtime. They knew something was seriously wrong. Um, that, I just, I don't know. That was hard to deal with, and, you know, they did cry when they talked about it. And the other thing, actually, is the cover itself, because some, Jill designed... Let's look at it again. Well, I was, they did tell me about the earlier drills. The later drills had uh, water that would keep the dust down. But right. before that, the life of a miner, they said, was about 10 years. That when you drilled, you'd fill that, what they called a pumpkin with oil. And as you're drilling, it would spray back in your face and you would breathe it in. And the reason I was searching for a photo like this was this does show, they just call these men off the job, come in and have your photo taken and their noses are black. And, and one way you can see this is that Jill designed the website. Now, this is from a photo. How big was it? Maybe two by three. It was very small. It was, it was a postcard, postcard size. Postcard. Not only did she enlarge it for the cover, it's on the website that Jill, by the way, created the entire website. And my favorite feature of all is when you really want to see what a miner looks like, if you go on the website and you click on books, you go to the Line Mountain cover. And I'm, I, it might be the second time that you click. If you just wait... A couple of seconds, an orange button appears in the bottom right. And when you click on that, then the picture is so large you can only see a few letters. Scroll around and then you can see the expression on their faces. You can see that some of these men here were wearing glasses or had them off and the, the outline of the glasses is there where the oil sprayed on their faces. And, and at least four of these men died in mine accidents. I don't have the names of all of them, but at least four of them that are in the book... Uh, that are in that photo died. Some of the gravestones are in there. But it just, it's so, it impresses me so much. I still do it almost every day. I still look at that picture, the close up view of all these men. It's, you can see the, the pain and the suffering and the toughness. In every face. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and these people, you know, I didn't realize at first how many of these are known to Lion Mountain people. When you sit down with Jerry Blanche, he can name most of those men. I, I didn't have the list, but I, I do have Those are some indelible memories, and when you mentioned about the pain and suffering and, the, you know, the, the phrase post-traumatic stress disorder had not mm. been invented then, but that's precisely what these men and their families went through, and it's not dissimilar to what uh, men and women get in time of uh, conflict. Yes. As we're yeah. in the yeah. middle of this Iraq conflict as we speak, uh, and you wonder how they dealt with it. Mm -hmm. Because they were not, the store, the company did not send them to a, to a licensed psychiatrist or psychologist. Right. You, know, you know, the phrase you would get if your legs were smashed was deal with it. Yes. And one point I do try to make in the book, you know, the, as you go through each chapter, you see the suffering of the immigrants, the suffering of the miners. But the last chapter deals with sports mainly. It deals with um, Oliver Pavetta was a very locally famous bowler very famous and the championship bobsled teams you know they won national titles they probably would have won at the Olympics if not for World War II eliminating the Olympics that year but it deals largely with baseball and it's been said that you know they they do call it a melting pot but a lot of the nationalities did not get along they were separated oh in gosh Europe. no that's a huge and, part of the story and they did fight here too but oh yeah baseball didn't cure everything, but it did help bring people together. When you had to go out and root for the Polish guy and you were Italian, 
you know, he's your third baseman. You need him. <laughs> and it, it did help. And then, you know how the town always supported Line Mountain Baseball. Oh, my, my, dad, my, my. my dad is Ronald Lilly. <laughs> my dad recalls watching Line Mountain play the Plattsburgh Majors back in the 30s. And that's when you had to have uh, police protection for the games. <laughs> and, that's uh, very interesting. But, but, and you're not, that's not an understatement either. That's, but it, it did, bring, uh, did bring the town together. And, and you know, the, the names Chase and Kowalowski, and there's so many others that I do list in there. I, I do cover a lot of original information on baseball. Um, you know, Lion Mountain is known for being tough, and they will argue, they'll argue anything, they'll argue baseball. Well, I did tell some of them that um, in, in 1933, I think it was, they celebrated the 50th anniversary of baseball. But I have record of games played in 1877, and in the very first year, it ended with a big controversy, and Lion Mountain argued and walked off the field. So that's where they got their start. I and they are, they are the best team up here and I do plan to do a book just on the minors baseball team. Oh, that's it, wonderful. It we is covered wait. in there some you know the highlights but there's there's so much information. There's a few guys there that are that I believe would have been major league ball players if not for some of the obstacles they faced. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Jill, how do you get on the website? I, everybody's just wondering. Website? We didn't know there was a website. It's www.bloatedtoe.com. I didn't ask you where bloated toe came from. Can no. we can we tell people or do we? You, Jill would probably be the one to tell that story. Go ahead. Um, we were we do a lot of hiking, climbing mountains, canoeing, things like that. And usually when we climb a mountain, we get up to the top and we take off our shoes and socks and relax, eat lunch and things like that. Maybe lie in the sun. And Larry just happens to be very tasty as far as bugs are concerned. So he, of course, okay. got, <laughs> mm -hmm. he, he had gotten several bug bites, and so when we were on our way down the mountain, he mentioned that he had a bloated toe from apparently a bug bite. And Only was, Larry Gooley would okay. refer to as bloated toe. So well. I said, and we had, prior to that, we had been discussing, this was, this was a few years ago, we were still, we were discussing this book back then, discussing publishing it himself, starting his own publishing company, I said, hey, Bloated Toe Publishing, that's what we should name our company. So here we are several years later and finally doing it. And I think he was a little surprised She's that I said, let's go ahead and uh, design. call it Bloated Toe. But he went oh, there's a picture of the bloated toe. Come yeah. on. That's her toe. <laughs> my toe was in there, but it was replaced by a more attractive toe. Okay, apparently. that's not really my toe, what it looks like. <laughs> I just used that as a template and I brought it into paint shop and... <laughs> <laughs> used various yeah. tools to make it bloated and red and the website is mentioned in the uh, www.bloatedtoe.com that's mm -hmm. easy enough and it's also and they in can the book. email sales at bloatedtoe.com Joe, what page is it on in the book probably um, on the top it appears on maybe copyright page yes yeah, the copyright yeah yes yeah, copyright page roman numeral four in case anybody does want to contact. So this is actually the first publication for Bloated Toe. Yes. yes. We are, Jill did put the Altona book on on the site. And actually it's been, I can't believe this, but it's been selling very well. I think six in the last two days. One from Georgia. A woman mm -hmm. was looking at the Line Mountain book. And when she saw that, she saw the Flat Rock book. Jill said that she said, that, well, that's where I was raised. And she had to have one. So wow. She was very mm -hmm. excited to, to show yeah. her kids where she grew up. Because she's been traveling around the country. Her husband is in the military. <coughs> so. Everything is connected. Mm -hmm. One with the other. It's my hue and cry. The Gordy Little hue and cry is that everything's connected. And the fun is discovering all these connections. Yes. Yes. The beauty of the internet is it shows you the lines of connection. Mm -hmm. And you will get email, as I do, from parts of the country. Every time we run a television show or I write a newspaper column. Yeah. When we did our... our tours of the Flat Rock region. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how many people want to know exactly how did you get in there and yeah there's really footprints in the cement up mm -hmm. there and you know mm -hmm. all that great stuff. You're both charming, Thank you. intelligent, mm -hmm. sensitive, wonderful people and gracious hosts and that won't change after Calvin and I get out the door either and it's been nice and toasty and warm I have to tell you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for our my back, well, I've covered my backside. Delivery yeah. this morning. Yeah. Uh, Any bookstores? Are, are, is this available locally in bookstores? No, right now it's available 
through bloated toe. See, I already asked cases. him this question okay. off camera, but I wanted to make sure. Or contact us here. Yes, they can buy it off the website. Um, his mother, Anna Gooley, does have a few copies in Champlain. <laughs> okay, that's important <laughs> to if, know. Uh, oh, yes. People live closer to Champlain, and they'd like to pick up a book there. She is equipped yes. with to make change, and she has some signed copies of the book to sell. Um, she's very protective of them, though. <laughs> Uh, we also left several copies with Rita Quetchen in Lion Mountain. She's been extremely helpful to us um, in selling the book. She allowed us to operate off her front porch last Saturday. We had several Lion yeah. Mountain residents come it, up. Isn't the North Country books. a wonderful place to live? And I hope this program is shown in New York City sometime. <laughs> that, that would selling made, books off her front porch, and oh, she's got to That would have made a great show. My son was visiting from California, and he, he wanted to come out, but I didn't think he was going to. So... Rita let us set up on her porch, and we had at least 30 or 40 deliveries to make that day. People would come and pick them up there. So we were saving them the cost of shipping. Well, it turned into a book signing because I had only signed 12 for the people that asked. Well, for two hours, I signed. Mm -hmm. Jill handled the financial transactions. But the great part is all the elderly people came in on the long porch. They would sit down and start telling stories and listening. Oh, it was, it was great. Two hours, nonstop. And you really should have had Calvin or somebody there with a video <laughs> camera to catch that yeah, whole thing. My son did film a little bit of it. But Some, no. So many moments in history are lost. There's nothing we can do to recover them, shy of interviewing the people who were there in places before video cameras and audio tape recorders were invented. Um, this, you know, besides being a tribute to you and the people who were in Lion Mountain, it's a tribute to guys like Calvin have done this for the last twenty some years doing thousands of events and and capturing them those things for future mm -hmm. generations and it's it's wonderful to be a part of it. Yes. This is an enriching educational experience yeah, for, me. for me. I hope you both will stay in touch with me and with Calvin and let us know what your future escapades sure. and endeavors will, you know. We won't follow you anywhere, but we'll follow you in the places that are at least well trod. <laughs> we wish you the, bo the very best holiday season as we're recording this in early December. Best of everything to you for the rest of this year and the year Thank to you. come. Thank you. Thank you. And the same to all of our viewers out there, wherever you are and whatever you're doing. Who knows where we're going to be next time for our little corner.